do, let's uh, uh, let uh, Mohammed start. The uh, title of the presentation is Robust Non Traditional Methods for Traditional Problems in Spectral Documenting Each Process. And Mohammed, of course, specializes in documenting. Thank you. So, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Alan Kulibak. So, uh, first, uh, I would like to, uh, and uh, I'm very delighted to be here today, and uh, I thank you to Professor Suen and uh, Professor Alan uh, Kulibak for the invitation to this keynote. And uh, for the researcher of Sampami, I see a couple of them and uh, young researchers. It's just, uh, it's like an anniversary today, Professor Sweet. 30 years ago, August 10, I was looking to the door of Dr. Suen as a postdoc. So I landed from France, from Paris 6, uh, and I was supervised by the Professor uh, uh, Jean-Claude Simon. Oh, okay. And at the end of the uh, talk, you will see some uh, similarities of uh, our work and so on. And uh, so, uh, uh, Professor Suan opened the door to me and for the researchers. After 30, 30 years, I'm here as a keynote speaker. Thank you so much. So these are the opportunities for young researchers. And today to have like uh, what we call in France, le 400 mètres, so the 400 meters in the race. So I am bringing with me my postdoc so that we can continue this, uh, uh, this uh, habit about how to, to bring uh, the new generation to take over the, uh, the bar and so on. So today, I'm also uh, happy to talk about uh, uh, our work, research work, but what I wanted to do today is more to have a little spectating, uh, 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 say, uh, study about our community in, uh, during the last 20 years. What we have done in document processing, and opening the door to a new era, which is meant to speak on image processing. And this is the title of why it is non-traditional methods for traditional problems. Traditional problems are in general for document processing, uh, document segmentation, binarization, and so on and so forth. But uh, we are tackling that from one angle, what we call the traditional methods, which fail, as we will show, or will not succeed to fulfill all the task. And maybe if we open the door to other theories from other fields, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, remote sensing and other fields that are a solid in mathematical background, maybe we can bring some tools, the new tools and so on. And this is why robust, not traditional, for traditional problems, document image processing. So the talk is organizing, uh, uh, is organized, sorry, about, as the following. First, the two points, I will uh, introduce document image processing beyond the visible system. So the need for invisible domain to enrich our field with new and rich information and so on. And to borrow what we call algebraic method for spectral image processing, they are more suited to our problem. You will see how they are elegant and how they are simple to use when you have uh, such a rich information. Then we go, they go through the demonstration to showcase about this modeling by the work of uh, uh, Dr. Rahish, who just uh, recently graduated, and he did some great work and very interesting work about uh, what we call NMF, non-negative matrix factorization. So all about this is the spirit of the talk. So let's uh, dig into the first uh, item, which is document image processing beyond the visible spectrum. So here, uh, without uh, further words, you, you, you know the transparent, the document it was one of the inventions of a human being. And uh, it was a process that when we are, uh, we were in the era of computer. So we did what we call digital transformation for document. So from the paper document to its digital, uh, digital, uh, digitization and uh, to its processing and for document understanding. So this is the pipe in general, so that we have this automatic processing of uh, document. So in these uh, uh, applications, we have so many applications. You can see here, for example, with Amazon recognition, from a scene like this one, you can extract the text and you can recognize, uh, recognize it. In another competing application, with what we call the layout document analysis, 
either logical or physical, you can extract the, 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 the visual object, what we, the visual object that we are interested in, and we can understand them. And the third one is form, form, form processing. So with this form processing, you can extract the targeted fields and you can process them. So my question today, we are revisiting our problem and I would like to have this discussion with you is, what is the common feature or the common factor in these three applications? What we try to do? So the question is, what is common between these documents or these tasks, the three tasks? <coughs> what we try to do is to separate something from something is a separation problem. So this is the concept I would like to develop today. Is it a separation problem? So object separation is one of the fundamental tasks of this field. The second point is because we are doing the separation in the visible domain. So the visible domain, what we see, what we get. So these documents have some what we call unseen uh, information. And also uh, here documents are not degraded. The real world applications in general, the documents are degraded. So how to deal with the severely degraded documents? And this is uh, one of our uh, uh, active research during the last 20 years. So if we dig into the pipe of the processing, efficient document image processing, in general, you need the three uh, steps. The first, steps, the first step is good document uh, C. The second one is about, and this is the most important because when you do a pattern recognition task, and this is a bit absent in our field, is to come back to knowledge domain. What kind of acquisition system? What kind of information you have so that you can feed your, your you, can, you can feed your system. So efficient imaging system is the key stone element in this situation, in this study. Efficient processing uh, algorithm. Once you have the two elements, you focus on what you call efficient processing, uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, efficient models you build and so on and so forth. So what it does mean, the first one, it does mean that in general, the ideal situation is clean, not degraded objects, structured contact, contained patterns, complete scene, no missing, no missing information, but this is ideal situation is not uh, always under control. The efficient imaging system, what we need is an efficient and accurate reliable visual representation. We need an accurate visual representation. So a vision system that accurately extracts the objects. And then this will help or ease the subsequent uh, 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 steps. The third one is uh, efficient processing are not limited to a type of specific set of images, do not depend heavily on labeled data. In general, we use supervised algorithm. So we need annotations. We need many labels here and there, which is hectic. And we, uh, the, 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 the research failed to include uh, in an in, uh, in efficient way unsupervised methods. So unsupervised are more suitable when there are no labels and not also application driven. So we categorize, categorize the degradation in modern and in uh, old or ancient document. In modern, you have, uh, you have this uh, distortions or shadow or show through or uh, a non flat and so on. And you have uh, some noises in the document processing. And the second application, which is more severe is this is what we are doing. We are, uh, we are dealing with the historical documents. And especially we had a great project with uh, uh, La, La Bibliothèque de Quebec, so the, the uh, uh, Quebec Library, which is here in Montreal down, uh, downtown. And then we try to digitize and, uh, and also dig into this, uh, this material. So ancient documents contain several types of degradation, contain unstructured content. Also, you have a mixture of materials, mixing inks, so you use many inks and you have uh, missing data with the degradation with age, you lose the paper and so on and so forth. So how to deal with this? So this is uh, uh, the idea. 
The second problem that we want to revisit with the, uh, together is about the efficient imaging system. This is how to imitate the human visual system and capture the human what can see. This is what we can see with RGB. The camera CCD can capture this information and this is what we appreciate. We try to see other insects like a bee. What we can see from the same scene. So amazingly, when we see the bee, the bee has exactly the same trichromatic vision system and focus on the three components. But these three components are green and are blue and ultraviolet, UV. And uh, this, the, the bee is very sensitive to the UV so that you can seek this red line that the human being cannot see. When you see the, you cannot see them. And what is the goal of those straight lines to uh, to ease the uh, to uh, the, the bee to seek uh, ne a nectar? So the vision system, what I want to uh, to convey as a message, the vision system is uh, built for a certain function, for a certain task. If we want to, for example, if you want to build a camera for document, we would like to understand what kind of information we want to capture and what, for what. So this is what we try to understand from the, uh, the, the other animals and insects so that we can infer this. So since the UV is very interesting, we try to understand the, uh, beyond the visible domain how it can help our field. So here you have two documents degraded, how they look like. It's difficult to see, disappear. So with the UV, it's amazingly, you can see what you could not see. So you can discover better the text and even here the watermark. So with this idea on, on, on mind, so the people were interested in discovering what we call hidden information. And here, for example, for these documents, with the camera CCD, you cannot see or you can see only what you, are, what, what, what you see here. But if you go through some bands, and especially the ultraviolet, you can discover all the regions. For example, here the red ink and other uh, patterns that can help you to understand better your what you, what is in inside your documents. So this is uh, to uh, embrace and especially to motivate why the multi speaker can help the uh, our field to uh, to. Uh, recover and have better information on our ancient, especially ancient or degraded documents. So how can spectral imaging help? This is the, uh, uh, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and you have the frequency and the reverse side, the wavelength. It's exactly the same when it's just the inverse. And you have all the spectrum from the radio, microwave, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, X-ray and so on. And you can have uh, from this information, a, a stack of information depending on uh, uh, of what you are looking for. So the idea is here, the advantages, it's uh, that capture more details, can reveal hidden information, open the doors for more applications because uh, you shed the light on something you cannot see or capture by uh, 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 usual uh, uh, visual systems. And also, which is important, non descriptive for documents. So this is a great uh, news so that we can uh, preserve our heritage, for example, using this uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques of imaging. So from where, uh, the, what is the origin of this? It came from remote, in, remote sensing, the first developed in this area. So by uh, moving the sensor platform, on the uh, a parcel of, uh, of Earth, for example, you can see the information over the different wavelengths uh, uh, and you can capture the information in 3D. And this is what is the outcome, the 3D representation of this uh, scan. So three-dimensional hypercube assembled by studying two-dimensional information, spatial and spectral. So in the depth, spectral scan lines. So you can have the depth uh, of your uh, of a slice during or during the uh, uh, this uh, wavelength uh, uh, visit. So what it it can say is what it can say is 
you can provide what we call spectral signature or fingerprint of your material. So in that parcel, you have a tree, fabric, plain and grass, and over the, the frequencies or the wavelength, you have different slices and you have different reflectance of this object over the wavelength. And in that way, you can produce what we call the signature of that. So you have a signature of that material. Can we use this uh, remote sensing techniques, techniques and knowledge for documents? Yes, of course, we can have exactly the same thing. It's a matter of resolution only. Instead of here <laughs> to talk about micrometer, and uh, you can talk about a nano for the, for the images. And uh, here you can have uh, a, better, a good information for uh, info, uh, uh, images uh, under the scan of uh, imaging system, multispectral imaging system. So to appreciate this, this is a Nikon D700 uh, uh, image, which is a great image. We try to see how it looks or how it is perceived over the different wavelengths. Okay, so over the different wavelengths, exactly what appears is exactly the object as seen or reflected on that wavelength. So this is what we are looking for. We are looking for different informations or reflectance information over the different uh, uh, wavelength uh, information. So this is uh, very interesting for documents so that we can visit for a certain uh, uh, nanometer wavelength. So some application, so you see material identification, for example, it's like uh, remote sensing, we can do material identification using the signatures or this fingerprint uh, spectral signatures. The second one is to uh, uncover erase the text here. Some text has been uh, replaced or erased. And with this information, you can uncover that information. And uh, for forgery detection, for example, if you see that the zero was, uh, was inserted uh, in uh, between four and seven, and the immersive spectral can reveal what is inserted and which, uh, with which ink, which is very important. Okay, so this is the idea about how to uh, uh, dis uh, distinguish between these. Now, the problem for document processing is how to design this camera with different filters and different uh, wavelengths. So it depends on the uh, uh, the market and it depends on you have uh, cameras with six bands seven bands eight bands ours in the lab is eight bands it's 20k euro okay it's about 20 uh, 20 000 euros and uh, we bought it from italy and it uh, not all the countries have these technologies you have uh, in italy and you have in usa so you cannot find this camera easily so these are the different bands or you use what you call hyperspectral all the bands, possible bands, and you have what you do with that. So you have, you have some difficulties with that in the research. First is different numbers of bands, different input features. This is one of the complexities. The second one is information redundancy. So you have a bunch of uh, extra information, what to do with the redundancy. So you have to, uh, to apply or to perform band selection and reduction so that you reduce the, uh, the information. The third one is variable content, variable, variable spectral signature. This makes the generalization power of your system very hard. So this is, uh, and also the problem of document is scarcity and sparsity. Scarcity, not enough data, so that you do what we call labeling and also uh, supervised uh, approaches. Nature are sparse because of the data nature of handwritten or uh, or, or the, image, the written information within the document. It's sparse. So how to capture that sparsity? From that point of view, we have uh, uh, studies since the last 20 years, and we just captured a couple that uh, they tried uh, since the 2000 to be inter uh, interested in, for example, material identification, but material on color images. And you have uh, text restoration. Uh, Tonazini from Pise, from Italy. She was the first talking about non-linear uh, uh, discrimination between text and non-text. Uh, Salerno in Italy also principal component and ICA. 
So uh, the Italian were uh, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very active in uh, in researching this. Uh, and then in 2012-13, uh, uh, Synchromedia with uh, our uh, Dr. Hajam Rashid addressed the problem of MS document using standard binarization technique and also others ICA and so on. We contributed in 2015 with a database. We, 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 we see that in our uh, field, there is a lack of databases, bench, bench databases. So on which database you, you have to contribute for the community. So we built one, the first contest and database for text extraction in, uh, in MS document images, and it was published in IAPR databases website. So it was, uh, we had a paper in Igdar 2015 and published it the database and the people are using it as you see in, uh, uh, in the literature. So if we try to analyze the last 20 years, uh, these are uh, uh, our uh, uh, understanding what is happening in, uh, in our community. First is focus on binary decomposition. This is what the means what we have, is text, non-text. So it's a binarization problem because we haven't data that can move, go beyond that. The second uh, uh, element is uh, our application driven, adapted from traditional approach design for grade level. Our community, we, are, uh, we were very, very uh, uh, active in uh, using the grade level and because they are cheap and uh, this is what we had. We, can't, we cannot uh, uh, go through all scanning the document and so on. And this is what we have. So we worked on that. The, the we is our community to work on, on that problem and developed many supervised and other uh, machine learning algorithms to de disappear and extract from forms and documents and so on and so forth. However, when we move to spectral image, uh, 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 image processing, require more active on subjective manual selection of few beds. We do it by hand. UV, infrared, and so on, and we do the processing. So there were no active work on, uh, on uh, automatic selection. Supervised based method give poor performance to the lack of uh, labeled data. And algebraic methods, in general, they were restricted to PCA and ICA. We didn't go beyond that. So there, there was no, from our knowledge, no framework that can help the uh, progress of our field. So this is why we try today to pose the problem in a certain way to uh, have the opportunity to uh, extend our understanding of uh, algebraic methods. So the conclusion is object, we are dealing with object separation. If this premise <laughs> is correct, so this is what we are dealing with. The, this is, uh, the second one is uh, several promising applications are possible by uh, multispectral imaging and traditional method fail to handle all the raised challenges. So we have an opportunity here for the community to extend, to seek new ways for, uh, to address this MS, or, uh, uh, MS uh, problems. Now the research question can be revisited and reformulated in a certain way if we want to uh, develop new ways. So what is the research question? So we reformulated in this way. How to simplify the low level processing of, uh, of uh, multispectral uh, document images and benefit from the rich spectral representation. So we have two, uh, uh, we have two uh, uh, features here. First is to how to simplify. And the second why is uh, the spectral information is rich, how to, uh, to, to, to make benefit from its existence without, and these are the constraints before, being restricted to a specific offset images, number of channels, it should work for any number of channels, and targeting a specific application. It is, say, say in other words, it's like a general framework which can work in any uh, application. So what candidate can answer the above question? from all the theories we have, from machine learning, from uh, algebra, from others, what is uh, the most suitable way to solve uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, multispectral uh, multi uh, 
uh, image uh, uh, images. So what we uh, uh, try to understand the last uh, few years is to uh, investigate algebraic method for spectral image processing, and we uh, try to uh, uh, to uh, tell about the rationale. What is the rationale? Why we have chosen this uh, uh, this field? So the idea is we have been influenced or uh, 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 inspired by what we call blind source separation perspective. The blind source separation problem is exactly what we had in mind, mind is how to separate uh, our scene. And this is our, uh, uh, and this is our uh, premise. The premise is if you have a stack of images, this is what you have in input. So the goal is to, to, uh, to uh, separate them, decompose them in different slices depending on uh, like paper, text, stamp, date, and so on and so forth. Our premise of understanding is the paper is like a stack. The paper is you start from the white page and you add and you add and you add and it's multiple layers of information which is stacked. So how to demix that? So this is the idea how to separate. This is how we produce the information. Information production is exactly uh, and by the way, even uh, when you go to uh, uh, to how to build, uh, I was uh, oh this is my batch. <laughs> uh, so when you build uh, uh, a business uh, uh, a credit card, if you go to the credit card in uh, in the business uh, line, it's a stack of layers. And from the electronic way. It's uh, one, one layer, second layer, third layer, and what you have in your uh, pocket. So the idea is the information, and this is uh, when, uh, when I have visited that uh, company, uh, it was a, a, great, uh, a great inspiration to go through this separation problem from many ways. We use it in 2010 PDEs, partial derivative equations, to use how to differentiate the, the different inks and so on. And now we are visiting Gabon. So the inspiration came from BSS, uh, blind source separation, and we visited the cocktail party problem or blind source uh, separation. What is this cocktail uh, blind problem? Is uh, when we are in a scene, like environment like this one, and you have uh, a mixing sounds, many sounds come to your auditorial uh, system. So our brain is uh, uh, its task is to separate the different individual individual sound, and this is what we have at the end. So the blind source separation of this problem is from the mixing you and mix the signal, and you separate them in uh, high quality and high fidelity of what you heard and so on. And the brain of uh, a human brain is so intelligent to make the difference uh, in the difference of sound and so on. So we try to see the document has exactly the ability this, uh, of this feature. So this is the goal of BSS to reverse the mixing process. So to understand it now from the image point of view, what is the problem statement of image from the mixing and then a mixing? So given two images, if you take them in uh, to align them, the first image, the second image, you multiply them by mixing matrix. At the end, you have a stack of mixed sources. Now that big matrix, you can or reorganize it, it as a stack of images with the same size from the sp special information as the same size as the input one. So you have a pile or you have a stack of information, which is mixed sources. But in reality, the problem which is posed is a reverse. What you have in reality, you have this mixed information and you are seeking to estimate these two images. This is the problem. So from mixed images, you can organize them in a big image and algebra, you tell some tools to demix them. How to demix them is to find the basis images, the original images, with some uh, 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 what we call coefficients there. So this brings us to what we call how to apply 
blind source separation for documents. And we started from there. Okay, so this is our, uh, our premise. So the idea of blind source separation is data and n, uh, which is the size of the, the, your data. And you can, uh, you can have two low rank images, the basis, and you have the coefficients with the rank K. And this is uh, all about the blind source separation. What are the theories that are proposed to solve this problem? You have three theories. You have statistical based methods. The K rows of the coefficient matrix are statistically independent. You have uh, a sparse component analysis where the coefficient matrix are forced to be sparse. What it does mean sparse, more zeros for efficiency. And then you have the third uh, trend, which is non-negative matrix factorization NMF, which is of our interest. And we will see why NMF is one of the greater trends. So besides the BSS, the blind source separation, we can be, someone can be interested just to understand what is the linear uh, algebra about this factorization. In general, the one, uh, what we call factorization or decomposition, one, one, one matrix can be decomposed in two or three or more matrices. But it depends on the properties of the factors, what you are seeking. So you have many methods there. You have SVD for people who are uh, familiar with the singular value decomposition. So you have uh, this uh, orthogonal matrices multiplied by uh, the uh, covariance matrix, or you have uh, the Egan value decomposition or uh, either QR decomposition or lower upper decomposition. And the end we are lending for where we are lending is X equal MA uh, uh, with NMF, non-negative matrix uh, uh, factorization. So non-negative matrix factorization is exactly what we said before, is the decomposition for the basis and for the coefficient. And with low rank, with the, the, K, the K is a rank. Now, why non-negativity? Why we have chosen this? Because in real world applications, images are non-negative. So uh, this is why we have chosen this, uh, to not uh, have any other post-processing so that you can, uh, you can change the values from negative and so on and so forth. The non-negativity forces the basis element to keep the same representation, original, which means no post-processing. So the basis have exactly the same size as the original one, which is good news. So no further processing in, the, in that side. So the other one is non-negativity leads to part-based decomposition. Non the NMF can, if you give this kind of part, it can be decomposed in simple elements. So this is a great feature also from the NMF. And the third one, which is non-negativity, forces or induces sparsity. So the solutions are sparse, which is a great feature. Here you compare, for example, a decomposition between PCA and NMF. If you see the matrix, the, uh, the, 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 the basis, you see here, it is sparse if you compare it with the PCA, okay? which is efficient for the computation. Okay? And this is why we are looking for sparsity in general. So the idea is with the NMF, we are in a good frame, uh, framework where the uh, many features are helping the document to be processed in, uh, in an efficient way. Some applications, you have a face recognition, as we mentioned before, uh, the basis can be facial features and the importance of a feature for the coefficient. You can have topical uh, modeling, the topical modeling, you have a document and you have uh, words and, and so on, and you can cluster them depending on the topics. And the third one, which is more obvious and direct, which is audio source separation. So audio source separation is one of the application of NMF, and it does, uh, it does great work for speech in general. So learning from all this, uh, learning from all this, we try to uh, stop once again, to understand also the, what we call model formation. For image processing, model formation is very important. 
before uh, processing X-rays or tomographic or document or uh, natural images, understanding the, the information is very important. Let's see what is going through this uh, multispectral document image, uh, imaging. So if we take the cube, the multispectral cube, it is exactly this uh, slice is a spatial information and the depth is the wavelength. It's a stack of information over the wavelength. So you have this cube of information. If you take one pixel, now, if you focus in this pixel, XIG, so in the, 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 the depth is the reflectance, the, the, the reflectance vector, which is the spectral information. Those, so the spectral information of that pixel, which is exactly a combination is a response, the spectral response in each pixel combination of the spectral responses of a number of sources. So here, just for the example, they are all the sources and it's a, combina a linear combination of those sources. And uh, from uh, the algebra point of view, you can organize your data so that it looks like this one. So you have the metrics, which are the basis multiplied by the vector of A. And it becomes a capital A if you, uh, uh, you scan all the image because we have only one uh, pixel image. So this is great news. Uh, organizing our multispectral images in such a way so that element <coughs> in a matrix form is x equal ma, x equal ma for all pixels. This uh, formula tells you something. We have seen it in NMF, in non-negative matrix factorization. So this is a good news. In practice, the, we have only x, we seek ma, and which means the NMF formulation. So now our problem has an answer in NMF so that we can deal with that part. This is a motivation why you are using NMF. And this is a demonstration of using NMF answer the problem of uh, uh, the linear mixture of modeling. So what are the advantages to go through this modeling with NMF? First is, uh, uh, before we say in our uh, approaches and so on, we are supervised and fail and so on and so forth because lack of labor data. Now, this approach is unsupervised. So we are in business, independent of the number of spectral bands, independent of the type of inks, exploit the spectral and spatial information of uh, pixels as well. And also what is important is non-negativity induces or forces sparsity. So we have sparse solutions. And this, from this cube, at the end of the day, we are uh, we we can uh, of course uh, make the decomposition, and at the output of the different processing, we can separate, for example, the background from the stem, from the stem from the text, and so on. And this is our aim. We work about how to separate all this uh, uh, information. The third element, which is important. Uh, 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 important here now how to model this the importance is formulated as an optimization problem. how what is the model of optimization is to minimize the error between x the decomposition x and ma so this is the error function or the cost function and this cost function can be the people who wants to use uh, uh, machine learning or other paradigms they can use it but it is exactly what we want to do is this is our cost function, and this is the regularization or penalty term. And this is uh, what is about. So now someone say, I want to use uh, NMS. Uh, is it a direct uh, use? You say, no, it's not uh, so easy like that. First is the decomposition is not easy. And we have to answer a couple of questions, a couple of research questions. First is the function of the model. What is the purpose of your model? So here you can do it for separa source separation. You can also, you can use it for uh, feature extraction, band selection, dimensionality reduction, and clustering. So depending on the task, you have a, a specific model. The second uh, target is the key feature. For example, for documents, the sparsity is very important, how to include it. The third element which is important is the cost function. 
what kind of cost function is important to for this application and the third is the penalty term which penalty term regularization is uh, can be included and then how to solve the formula once you have the model the optimization model how to solve it what is the solver behind it? so that you have an efficient solution and uh, uh, and this is what we are going to show in uh, the next slides so i invite my uh, uh, other fellow uh, dr Rahish, so that he can explain first uh, answers all these questions but not only that he's answering other questions that are related to documents because uh, when you deal with the intro document you have some characteristics for it. this is what we are going to discover yeah the time we take a quick photo and uh, I have to... <laughs> yes. uh, indeed when it comes to developing your animal model uh, to cover uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, many uh, challenges, many specific challenges to take, uh, to take into account. Uh, uh, the first one is the uniqueness solution. Uh, we need to, uh, as you know, uh, animal uh, deliver uh, many solutions is an cause of the problem. And for a given uh, problem, we can have many, many uh, solutions. And the question is how to select the, the, the best one that fit our needs. Uh, fortunately, this can be uh, done using uh, by adding some specific constraint to reduce the, uh, the solution the solution space, such as the orthogonality or uh, or, the, or, or the sparsity or other geometric um, uh, constraint. Uh, for the orthogonality, we are. Uh, we, we, we are looking for uh, for uh, axes that, that are uh, orthogonal, and we can uh, and uh, with this condition we can get rid of all uh, the remaining uh, solution. So the orthogonality, why the orthogonality? Because it is uh, uh, physically appealing. Because it 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 yields um, uh, um, uh, it improves the clustering um, properties of the model and uh, and it is uh, sometimes it improves the, the computational time uh, complexity of the model. So uh, this is from the the, the theory uh, point of view. What, what about the, the application? Let's go uh, through this uh, example. Here we have like um, a simple. It, it, uh, it is a phrase written in uh, visually we can uh, is um, uh, blue uh, ink but we but using four different uh, brands all of them are are blue and the idea is how to using the multispectral for scanning this document how to decompose this uh, this uh, how to differentiate differentiate between this uh, this different uh, inks so when when we uh, uh, apply the orthogonality on our model, we get uh, very amazing, uh, very, very amazing uh, results. When our model was able to separate the the, the, uh, the words of each, each ink from the remaining mi mixture, uh, and this was thanks to uh, the orthogonality we included, uh, and we incorporated into um, our uh, our model. Uh, for the details or uh, of the development and, and, and for the result, you, you can visit your uh, and, uh, your our, um, our work. Uh, but uh, another point here is is our um, uh, the orthogonality. The way we are we are incorporating the orthogonality is not uh, it, it is not uh, enough for for our need. Uh, here, the orthogonality we introduce the orthogonality and in indirect way. Uh, so uh, the, 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 uh, the problem is solved with the hope of obtaining um, of uh, having um, uh, orthogon an orthogonal solution at the end of the at the end uh, at the limit uh, point of the when the, uh, the the algorithm converts. So the question is, can we uh, deal with this uh, orthogonality uh, in the, in a different way? A different way? The answer is yeah. We can we can do that. We can. Incorporate the orthogonality using a direct way uh, via a direct optimization over this different uh, manifold. So, 
the idea is instead of uh, uh, instead of um, optimizing uh, this function uh, 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 with uh, with the constant with the orthogonality constant, the idea is to uh, to um, uh, optimize the, this this the, the directly optimize this function in in, uh, in the uh, in the specific uh, geometry that we are looking for. Which means the uh, uh, second maneuver. And by the way, the second maneuver is nothing else um, uh, the space of uh, all orthogonal matrices that we are looking for. And we are, and we uh, we, we can use uh, uh, like um, uh, gradient-like uh, optimization um, uh, method to uh, to solve the the problem. So uh, another uh, another point to solve before moving for moving forward is. Where to place the the, the, the orthogonality? Uh, the the, the animal factorization we we can get two factor or three. So on which factor we can uh, we we can uh, put the, this this constraint? Uh, fortunately, the the the, the animal problem is is um, is flexible, which allows us to either uh, either. Um, uh, uh, Incorporate the, the or place the, this orthogonality on the, the A matrix, the A matrix, or on both of them. Uh, the question, or uh, the ultimate um, uh, question that raises it is which one, which model is, is better? Uh, we try to solve this uh, to answer this question in uh, in our uh, in our work uh, below, and uh, we uh, we. Um, we refer you to, to, that, to that work to, to read the, uh, to, to, to see the, the development and the result of each, um, of each model. So uh, by now I can just show you some examples, not all of them, but a few, uh, few examples to show the, um, the, the, the advantages of uh, the uh, of over the statistical method. Uh, here we have like um, a database that has the, the, the data set which consists of two, uh, 250 bands of um, uh, uh, satellite, uh, the whole satellite. And, and, the, and the aim is to decompose this, <coughs> these images into, um, into the eight uh, components. So here we have, uh, we, I have this, uh, this example using, uh, the, using the standard, um, standard approaches like, uh, like Hemis and uh, uh, I see using also the NMF, using uh, using a uh, co competitive orthogonal NMF, and using uh, our one of our approaches uh, uh, um, that uh, that uh, use the orthogonality of the specific NMF. You can see that yeah, the orthogonality has it, it improves uh, greatly the, the the results. There is a huge difference between this 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 image, this this result and this and, and that and. Uh, the result we obtain, and also the the Stephen manifold strategy is 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 is, uh, is, uh, uh, is also um, uh, matters and and can help also uh, improving the the result further. Uh, another uh, another 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 example here with another data set, our data set, the the, the MSTEC uh, data set. And task here, the same task is to decompose uh, and input images. Here we are showing the, the pseudocolor image, but the input wa was uh, really um, a stack of eight uh, images. So, as we can see, our approach was able also to uh, to separate the the, 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 the the text from the background, from 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 the picture, from the line, from the background. Here also. We have the, uh, we have very complicated um, uh, scene. Uh, we have like uh, an overlapped text with uh, stamp and so, so on and so forth. And our approach was able to separate to decompose each material based only on um, um, uh, its signature. And to uh, we not have uh, we uh, using uh, or uh, moving from the the first of the data set to uh, to, that, to to this one, we did we didn't ch change anything in the setting of our uh, the same model. We used the same model, just we uh, just it was just a matter of um, tuning some parameters. Uh, the second the second uh, uh, 
problem or challenge we face is uh, related to the nonlinearity in, in uh, real world data set. And the, the, the linear uh, the modeling model we are based our um, approach uh, is so, so simple. And the, one can ask if, what if my, my data is not linear? Another question is related also to the, the vectorization, the reshaping of, the, of our, our, our data. Uh, don't forget that we are uh, we are moving from uh, to the representation representation uh, from three D to the representation to the to the representation. So there is uh, there is a transformation with with, with loss. We'll, what we lose we lose the local con connectivity between between pixels. So how can we uh, how can we uh, <coughs> we we, we uh, preserve uh, this information? Uh, the, the answer is through uh, a nonlinear kernel trick to uh, to um, address the problem of the nonlinearity in the data, and through also adding considering a graph um, a, a, a graph um, penalty, uh, that we incorporate into the into the model as as, uh, as we uh, we show here, and the result were very very, very amazing. And uh, we can see here that the model was able to differentiate between uh, two, uh, two types uh, of, uh, of things in the first uh, sample. In the second sample, uh, it, it, can, uh, it can be uh, able to um, separate the stamp from the text. And in the, in the third one, it was, uh, it, it was able to uh, Isolate the 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 the, 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 the degradation from the text from uh, the data. Uh, here also, we can see that that um, traditional methods were not able to uh, to address the problem of the decomposition. In fact, it was a problem of uh, of the text extraction only and. Using our, using our approach, approach we gain it a lot. We we produce it uh, like uh, an output that is similar to the the, the ground truth uh, that provided the ground truth. And uh, in, the, in the context of uh, of source separation, the number of sources is uh, one of the big challenges uh, that we that we face. Uh, we need at each time we need to set the number of of uh, of, uh, of, of uh, sources uh, and of course in, in the previous two methods uh, the, the, this number or this uh, the rank the presidential rank was set manually and we and which, which is not uh, practical so um, in order to make it uh, to, to make it um, automatic uh, that, that driven. We 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 we, uh, we investigated another uh, another setting, and we we formulated the, the problem as a probabilistic uh, problem in which we had this this um, this graphical uh, representation that uh, that uh, that uh, that, um, uh, that modeled the, the, our our problem. And instead of uh, instead of optimizing optimizing the uh, variable, instead of looking for the point wise um, uh, um, uh, optimum, we are looking for uh, for the model that generate this uh, this observations. And one of the features of our model is the the, the automatic relevance determination that allow us uh, the, the um, Inferring or estimating the um, uh, the number of uh, of uh, sources. So, uh, as as the experiment, the, the 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 automatic rank determination helps us estimating the number of uh, of sources from a given uh, given input. The principle is the 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 in uh, the this. Um, this ARD uh, turn off the 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 the, the, the corresponding uh, in, uh, in rows or columns that do not contribute to the to, to the model. 
and uh, and doing 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 uh, doing uh, doing that, we can obtain only uh, we can we can we can activate only the the the, the, uh, the, the images or the the columns that contribute something to uh, the decomposition. The, the remaining the remaining uh, columns will be uh, zero. So uh, from the uh, on the uh, um, an example from the, the, the text uh, extraction um, uh, evaluation uh, uh, shows that our approach was able to uh, to beat uh, um, either a standard um, uh, a standard method, which is who one of the best uh, text extraction methods, and also a deep learning based method used in uh, uh, a post learning uh, patient. And finally. Uh, when, um, approaching while approaching the problem uh, from the uh, from the the, the traditional uh, perspective, we can only answer question about which uh, and about um, if it if it uh, given pixel is a text or non text um, uh, or non text. But when we use um, uh, when we use um, method like uh, NMF, when we when we approach the problem from the blank blank situation problem, we can we can uh, we can address other issues. We can we can um, answer other questions like if the, the uh, how many uh, if the, how many um, uh, objects are in, in my scene. If the, 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 the things are similar, if there is, there is a forgery or not in my scene. Yeah, so uh, sorry, uh, a bit uh, just to summarize. Uh, and uh, one minute to summarize is uh, uh, first is to promote this uh, multispectral imaging and processing, and especially uh, to take this problem as from the beginning as a separation problem. This will help us move uh, towards uh, a new generation of algorithms and also uh, to move uh, towards unsupervised. Uh, uh, approaches and also these are very competitive to deep learning as uh, you have seen and with elegant framework and so on and so forth and, uh, and this is why it's uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, help to say uh, if people can uh, investigate uh, new or uh, non-traditional approaches but before going maybe I will invite some uh, I think George and Professor Soon can uh, uh, tell us what about this scene before. Uh, yes, it's it's fine. So uh, do you remember this? Okay. Uh, please come back to yeah. Professor Suen. About forty years. This is uh, thirty years also from Professor Simo when he was talking about regularities and singularities. And this principle is just to say separation principle in handwritten text. How to separate the from a text, the what we call ascenders and descenders. This is the regular part, and these are the singular or the accident part. He built a millionaire uh, a company, Aduzia, just behind that. Yes. The multispectral object separation problem, as far as I know, was first studied in the late 60s with the launch of the first multispectral satellite exactly. scanners. And people spent a lot of time on the question of bandwidth. So I was going to ask you, how does the question of the bandwidth of the six, eight, yeah, this is 10 band come into the algebraic? Yeah, for the algebraic, there is no problem. Is only how much they are uh, efficient, this uh, six or eight or uh, 10. It depends on the features or what you are seeking. For example, the system that we bought is eight. We were happy about that. Is eight is optimal? We don't know. But the bandwidth of each, how much does it matter? The band, each one has some bandwidth. If it's very yes. narrow, it's useless. If it's very wide, exactly. it's useless. Yes. For, for document, do you have what is the bandwidth? There are several. It's very narrow. It's at, it's very specific. It's very at, at very specific uh, wavelengths. Yeah, but how much? Of the, what is the distance between between one and, and the signal? It depends on the on the system. For example, in the eight. Eight. maybe maybe uh, maybe five ten. Uh, depends no. on the 
which you in eight events for the limit. What is the distance between how much they overlap? Yes, in the, spec uh, yes. In the spectral domain is my yes. It doesn't come into the uh, solution somehow. No, it, it comes to the how many redundant they are. How many uh, is that because if you use many, you have more redundant information. For example, if you use 32, you have some useless. But regardless of how many you use, there's a question of how wide they are. Yes. So I'm asking about. We didn't pay. Uh, no, we didn't. Yeah, well, we can talk about yes. it. Around there, around there, right? Yes. How wide or how? No, no, no. no. It's uh, the, the width. The width of the. Uh, yeah, very. Uh, right. Uh, he's the expert. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So okay. just to. Uh, and uh, this is the similarity between after three uh, 30 years to continue the separation. <laughs> well, I have one question. I have one question I'm asked. Yes, uh, you know, you read news on the uh, big news that uh, they use x rays to discover in paintings, you know, to discover <laughs> hidden paintings, for example, Picasso or oh, yes, Da Vinci, yes. you know, or the Mona Lisa. There was another painting, earlier painting. They used X. Would X be applicable to all documents? You know, document processing of all documents. Yeah, for the documents we from the what we uh, did in uh, our uh, investigation of all the uh, cameras and so on, they didn't go through until until those because yeah. it's very high. It's really very high. Yeah, it's the um, maybe it's a disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, and also yeah. Yeah. this is yeah. Yeah. this yeah. is one is destructive, but also the frequency is so high, maybe it's not very good. There, there are no bones in the document. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you again. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for uh, chairs and uh, members for organizing this uh, conference. Um, today I'll be presenting um, our paper under the title of Sentiment Analysis from User Reviews Using a Hybrid Generative Discriminative Hidden Markov Model along with a uh, Support Vector Machine Approach. Uh, I present myself. I'm Reen Masfi. I'm a fresh PhD graduate. Um, I defended my thesis one probably one month ago uh, at the Concordia University um, uh, Institute. This paper is a uh, co-authored uh, by me and my um, supervisor, Dr. Nizar Vigila. The outline of this presentation is as follows, introduction, related work, <clears throat> proposed model, uh, experiments, and uh, result discussion, conclusion, and then some representative knowledge. So um, the main topic of this paper is uh, around sentiment analysis. Usually sentiment analysis is used for many practical uh, applications. Uh, we need to analyze product uh, reviews online, for example, if you want, if you, you want to purchase something online. We need it for opinion mining and social uh, networks. Uh, we need it uh, and support chatbots, for example, uh, if we provide support, uh, automatic support uh, online. And this task is practically challenging because we need in order to achieve it correctly, we need to accurately identify customers' needs, understand the customer's feedback when it's, um, when it's regarding uh, a specific product. We need to determine uh, the effect on the buyer's opinion and feeling regarding the product. For example, if we want to review uh, a product on a marketplace, and there are a lot of reviews, uh, we need to assess uh, how much this pro how much this product is, is meeting uh, the needs of the customers, <clears throat> and we also need to automate this decision making. We don't need to run every um, every review by itself. So we need to better understand what are the good or bad features in order to enhance them. And 
um, we also uh, need to determine uh, actions to be taken in order to improve the survival process. So basically, um, the data format of this task is reviews. This, these reviews are mostly uh, available in text format. So it's a very unstructured uh, format. Uh, we need an appropriate modeling for these texts. We need to extract and provide useful insights about the products uh, reviewed to both the customer and the seller. So we need to automat automatize um, or optimize the, the task of uh, taking a decision uh, for the customer, for them to choose or not the product, or and also for the seller to enhance their product. We need to recognize the sentiments and attitudes in, in textual data. Uh, this textual data, as a matter of fact, provides a better understanding of trends and tendencies related to products. Why we thought of hidden Markov models is because hidden Markov models are a powerful tool to properly model um, some uh, sequential information. And the generic aspect grants a powerful way to handle sentiment recognition and HMM also because of their um, very, very strong uh, mathematical basis, they tend to require less training data than discriminative models. So for the related work, we mainly have two main approaches in recognition tasks. The generative approach where we model the underlying distributions of classes and the discriminative uh, approach where we give a sole uh, focus on the learning of the class boundaries, the head of which we have chosen as a generative method because this is a hybrid uh, format. We have chosen uh, HMM because they will help us to examine the events and then speculate or infer the aftermath. And they also require less training data. Support vector machines, uh, on the other hand, they dis distinguish between the, the difference between the categories and the classes. And they sometimes outperform HMMs if we have abundant data. So support vector machines mainly, um, they separate different classes. They use a kernel that allows efficient discrimination and non-linear separable input. Um, they adopt a convenient kernel. They, we, have, we need to choose a kernel with a function that's suitable for the classified uh, data and the objective task. And some of the conventional kernel that we that usually are used for the support vector machines are the linear, polynomial, and also the radial basis function. As for hidden micro models, why do we choose them as a generative? Uh, approach is because they have powerful prediction capabilities, observation-based reasoning, they perfectly handle sequential data, and they're also consistent uh, in their statistical framework. So it's basically um, handled the same way in, in every class. We have noticed main, some main challenges. So we have noticed that the multimodal data require a mixture of distribution to be efficiently modeled. So we have data. They are, it is multimodal, it, it doesn't fit, uh, I, will, I will try to get ahead, it doesn't fit a Gaussian distribution. So we thought that, which is the main distribution chosen for the emission probability of HMM usually, we decided to not take it as a Gaussian and we decided to go for other distributions because we have an unbounded support, which is not always accurately presented by, by the Gaussian distribution. So to wrap up the main contribution of this paper, um, basically two, uh, the fitted non-Gaussian distribution, which are uh, uh, used for the first time uh, with hidden Markov models in this paper and also in the thesis work. And also the hybrid generative discriminative approach, it is not itself um, a first time um, realization, but along with the hidden Markov model with the emission distribution as uh, the distribution that I will present, they bring more precision to the learning process using the Fisher uh, kernel. 
So to sum up the work uh, at a higher level of, of, this, uh, of this paper, uh, we have used the header Markov models that we denoted as, as follows. And we have opted for the, um, the following training procedure, where at first we initialize our values of parameters and the number of hidden states is set a priori. So we use, we choose the number of hidden states. Then we find the best set of state that um, uh, the state transition and emission probabilities by using the bound Welsh algorithm, which is um, uh, nothing but the expectation maximization algorithm. After that, we estimate the parameters that maximize the probability of that giving set of observation. And then I, at the end, we hopefully find out the most probable sequence that generated that set of observations, as well as the mixture components to solve that problem. So the general training procedure is stated as follows, which is uh, exactly the same uh, explained in the previous uh, slide. And the uh, the main, the first main contribution uh, is nothing but um, injecting the, this uh, new distribution into the framework of the header Markov models. So rather than using the Gaussian mixture models uh, usually used in the emission probability of hidden Markov models, we wanted to test the generalized inverted Dirichlet uh, mixture model. Why the generalized inverted Dirichlet? Because it allows a it's a distribution that usually allows a, a, a very good presentation of features in a transformed space, where features are independent and follow an inverted beta distribution. We also, by using, using the generalized inverted Dirichlet, we are helping ourselves relaxing the constraint of the strictly positive covariance of the, uh, the inverted Dirichlet distribution. Why we are stating the inverted Dirichlet distribution? Because this work is um, done to enhance previous um, previous findings. The Fisher kernel, the, the kernel that we have chosen to use with the, the score of inter machines, is the Fisher kernel. We have chosen um, Fisher kernels because it provides a general way of uh, generating. Uh, of using the generative, the generative and the discriminative uh, approaches for uh, classifying uh, our data. And we have formulated um, as follows. So when we look at the problem at a higher level, we are using hidden Markov models to see, uh, to, to infer hidden states from what we see. So what we see is the, are the words used in the reviews and what we will infer which are the hidden states is the emotion behind that word used in the review of the product let's talk about the experiments and some results so what did we use as data sets All, always finding data sets is a challenging task in, in, in every paper realization and in, in this one we have chosen to use uh, the notorious Amazon reviews data set from the Stanford, um, from the SNAP, basically. It's a corpus of product reviews collected from Amazon marketplace. We didn't work with the totality of the data set. We have chosen a specific data set that I will uh, explain later. And we also chosen the um, IMDP movie reviews data set to, to, to do some comparison. So the Amazon review data set, we have chosen only the electronic niche because it's, it's very wide. We have picked 30,000 uh, sample reviews from, from the training, uh, and we have constructed a vocabulary of 72,208 unique words. We segmented each word using the part of speech dagger that's used by the Stanford uh, NLP group. And we applied the default setting um, applied in the, um, in the mother paper, in the original paper. We also removed every num numerals, uh, auxiliary, uh, reverse, punctuation, stops, uh, spaces. We eliminated all that for a pre-processing um, 
a step. As an output, what, what did we get? We get an, a vector that's generated corresponding to each input word. Each review is modeled by a, a text vector um, that's obtained after rapid, uh, adding up all the words. And the, specific, the specificities of this um, uh, data set is that the subject are um, the sub the the subject are um, sorry this this is this is a, a, a this is an amendment from from a so for the experiments what did how did we approach the uh, the problem is that we have chosen to work on the electronic niche we randomly picked. 30,000 sample reviews. We segmented the, the words. We took the output vector, generated it, and then we model it and we fed it to the head and Markov model. The IMDB data set is roughly the same um, uh, uh, method as well, where we summed up every word to be uh, represented by a vector. For the head and Markov model itself, we have uh, chosen the number of states to be K equal to two, and the mixture component, uh, we have set them to be M2, and then we um, updated the mixture component each uh, iteration. The main results that we, uh, that we got by comparison to, to um, um, a state, uh, uh, state of the art, uh, methods that we have already tested for as well that are publicly available we have come to the conclusion that the um, uh, hybrid method always performs better than the sole generative method so this is the first win the first win is that when we use support vector machine along with the generative me uh, method it enhanced the uh, recognition the sentiment recognition accuracy and also there's another win is that we showed that the generalized inverted Dirichlet distribution performed better than the Gaussian uh, mixture distribution. So we now know that the generalized inverted Dirichlet even used with the generative uh, approach itself will lend us better results than the Gaussian. So um, just to conclude, we wanted to present a hybrid method, not only a generative method. So we wanted to automatically analyze sentiments from user reviews using a combination of hidden Markov model and support vector machines. We were able to enhance the model's capacity by taking the advantage of a powerful classification role that the SVM plays without neglecting the sequential aspect of the data. And we gave a special focus on modeling positive vectors or semi-bounded uh, vectors by using non-Gaussian generalized uh, inverted Dirichlet distribution as emission probability uh, for the hidden Markov model. We carried what we believe to be the first attempt to apply generalized inverted Dirichlet with hidden Markov models and also with the Amazon uh, and IMDB benchmark. We provided a comprehensive solution for sentiment detection, um, and we allowed the automatic recognition of positive and negative uh, emotions. And according to the results we obtained from the conducted experiments, we've proven that the proposed approach obtained highly accurate recognition rates compared to both the generative and the, uh, and the uh, hybrid um, uh, method. These are references closely related to the work that have done prior to this uh, to this paper. And I want to thank all the reviewers that contributed to approving the manuscript and also to the uh, organizing committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. We only have time for one short question. Please go ahead. Uh, you mentioned you removed auxiliary words. Sorry? You mentioned you removed auxiliary words. Yes. Uh, so, for example, if you remove do not, right, uh, or don't, then it is you are uh, actually removing the negation or positive sentiment, right? So, you can say a negative word. You can say a positive thing by using do not as a slot. 
Thank you for the question. Uh, for the first question, uh, the reason why we removed auxiliary words is because we have we had to uh, comply to the to the um, uh, benchmark uh, natural language processing method that we have uh, chosen to compare with. So and. Uh, to your um, to your uh, thinking, yes, I totally agree that uh, removing negation would probably affect the accuracy of determining the sentiment. But the focus of the NLP benchmark that we have used is only to assess the negativity or the positivity of the actual word used in the reviews. And there, there is a way to do it the other way by keeping all the negations and all the verbs as well, because they have been used, uh, um, eliminated here as well. But this is to, to be tested. Uh, for the second question, it is, a, it is a highly asked question, either in the reviews or the committees that I've um, tested. And in our case, the, the data that we worked on is not very abundant. So the need to test with deep learning methods wasn't in our aim of aim or focus. We wanted to test. The main aim is to show the, um, the powerful aspect of hidden Markov models as a generative approach, and also with the with the discriminant. You predicted sentiment at a word level rather than a sentence level. Exactly, at a word level. Okay. I think we don't have time any more time for for the discussion. <laughs> Okay, so our next um, uh, paper is uh, a spatial temporal memory for video animal detection. It's going to be presented by Ming Long Wang. It's going to be online. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply grateful to have this opportunity to present this special temporal united memory for video anomaly detection article in front of you. The reporter is Yun Long Wang, the supervisor is Hong Mini, and the cooperator are Ming Yi Chen and Jia Xin Li. First of all, here is the introduction of the video anomaly detection. The types of anomalies in surveillance video are very complex. The types of which can be rashly divided into abnormal appearance, short-term movement anomalies, long-term trajectory anomalies, group of anomalies, and abnormal time. However, video anomaly detection tasks still face many challenges, such as First, the dependency between the definition of an abnormal events and the specific scenarios. Second, the variety, the diversity, and the inexhaustibility of abnormal events. Third, the training samples tend to contain noise, which interferes with the training. Fourth, data policy. Currently available public data sets are few. And the following is the proposed method. From the perspective of philosophy, act according to circumstances. We propose a dual flow network to dissociate appearance information and motion information. Processing this information in two individual branches. In addition, we employ a special temporal united memory model to bridge relationship between appearance and motion. 
since there is another saying in philosophy that the things are universal and、uh, interact with、uh, each other. Thus, the heightened relationship in appearance and motion also ought to be another useful clue for detecting anomalies. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first work to detect anomalies with a special temporal united memory. The figure shows the overview of our special temporal dual flow network for video anomaly detection task. Specifically. We use the loss function of both the dual autoencoder network and the memory model to synthesize to generate the final regular score. First, we evaluate our model answer. Public available datasets. UCSD Part Two, Trunk Avenue, and Shanghai Touch. As we can see from Table One, our method gives the best results on all three datasets with a speed of 36 FPS. To collectively analyze the anomaly detection performance of our model, we visualize the anomaly detection examples on three datasets. As we can see, that when an abnormal event appears or disappears, the regularity score. Will decrease or increase rapidly, which verifies that our method does detect the anomalies in a high speed. In addition, to evaluate the effectiveness of the memory model we used. Several ablation studies on three datasets are also conducted. The corresponding LC results and the LC curves are shown, which illustrates that the connection of the flow network and the memory model is more suitable for practical and complex. Scenarios. Our method can use both of them and gain a peak performance. In comparison to the non-memory case, the model with a memory model can realize a more We read representation for the abnormal events. Concretely, we can see that normal regions are predicted very well, while abnormal regions are not. And abnormal events such as the appearance of the car, the appearance of the steering, the appearance of bicycle. Are highlighted. This also illustrates that our method is sensitive to the different abnormal events, and it has a high discrimination between normal events 
and the abnormal events. Finally, we make a summary and uh, outlook. In this paper, we have proposed a dual flow network with a special temporal memory model for video anomaly detection tasks. We have shown that processing the appearance representation and the motion representation respectively enabling our model make reasonable response to different information. We have also presented special temporal uniting memory which matches the motion information with the corresponding appearance information. In our future work, we will further study how to combine dual flow network and uh, memory model to achieve a uh, more ideal result under the promise of light light. Thanks for your attention. The next paper is uh, a new proposing method for measuring image uh, visual quality, robust rotation, and spatial shifts. It's going to be presented by uh, Guan Li uh, Chen. Hello, today I will present a new method for video quality measurement by using the standard metric MSSAM. My trick is MSSM is very sensitive to spatial shifts and uh, small rotation. Even you have very small shift and a very small rotation, the metric will become very slow. So that's the reason why we propose this paper in this conference. Our postal method propose consists of the following three steps. First, we propose by pre-processing the images for small shift and small rotation, it can be eliminated by our pre-processing. Our metric get much better result than the standard MSSM. Our proposed method have the following steps. We first perform a forward to 2D Fourier transform to take the spectrum. And then we take the logarithm of the spectrum. And then we convert it from Cartesian coordinate to polar coordinate. And then we take the 2D fast Fourier transform again. And then take the spectrum. And then we use the standard MSSM to measure the visual quality of the two images. In our experiment, we conducted a lot of experiments for this uh, new metric. And uh, for the standard my, uh, metric, uh, even if we have a small rotation, small spatial shift, but the result will be much lower. However, even, even when there is no introduction of rotation and uh, rotation and uh, spatial shift, our method still are better than the existing method, original method. As you can see from table one, our method is better than the standard method. As you can see from the correlation, CC, SROCC, and the root mean square error, all of them are better than the existing method. For table two, we have a small shift, small shift. So you we and a small rotation, you can see that the our score is much better than the existing method. As you can see from table two. From table three and four, we can see that for table three, table three is only have a small rotation, no without any spatial shift. We have a better result for the proposed method. Our method have a higher score than a very small, for small, very small rotation angle. For table four, we only have a small spatial shifts. We have no rotation. As you can see that our score is better than the existing method without uh, pre-processing. Our method is very simple. It's only for the 
to have some special uh, have to have some pre-processing to eliminate the, the spherical shape of the end rotation. Our method is uh, have a higher score than existing method. This is the uh, floating chart of our method. First, we have original image. Second, we take the fast Fourier transform and take the spectrum. Third, we will convert it from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. And finally, we take the Fourier spectrum again. This is the scatter plot of our method. As you can see from figure two, the first is the standard method, the second is our method. The on the right hand side is our method. As you can see, our method is very compact. To the all the points are screwed to the diagonal direction, diagonal lines. Our method is much better than the standard method, as you can see from the figure. You can also see that uh, our method is also better than the standard method. As you can see, the standard method, method the points are scattered everywhere. However, for our new method, the points are closely aligned to the diagonal lines. It's very compact. So our method is much better than the existing method. Now, I like to present our conclusion. By processing the both images, beta M, S, and M score can be obtained. Small spatial shift and the rotation angles <coughs> generate a higher score than the standard method with our method. Our experiment confirm our conclusion as well. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elena Rica, and I am a PhD student at University Rovira y Virgili. Uh, today I am presenting uh, a work that I have done with my supervisor, Susana Alvarez and Frances Serratosa, and it's called Learning Distances Between Graph Nodes and Edges. First of all, uh, I would like just to speak a bit, a bit about the graphic distance, as you know. As you know, if we have two graphs and we want to transform one into the other one, uh, the graphic distance framework uh, considers uh, the cost of deletion, insertion, and substitution of nodes and edges. Uh, so we have these operations and we can uh, give them some costs that we will call C1 or Cn uh, during the presentation. Okay, uh, when we have the concept of graphite distance, we can apply it uh, to solve classification tasks with the strategy of nearest neighbor. How do we do this? We just uh, consider the class of each graph as the class of the nearest uh, neighbor. In this case, this molecule, uh, sorry, this graph G uh, is classified as G sub B. But what happens when we have a, a, a graph that has been improperly classified with this uh, idea of nearest neighbor? What happened is that uh, the distance between the, the, the graph and the graph of a different class, like in, the, in this picture, this distance is lower than the distance with um, a graph that is of the same class. So with the method that we want to present, uh, what we do is uh, try to fix these classifications that have been uh, done in an incorrect way. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, what we propose is if we have one graph that has been incorrectly classified, we these distances that we I will call D prime and just D, uh, these distances are the minimum of the graphite distance between this graph and all the other molecules of with the same class or with a different class. So what, what we propose is we have in each step of a learning process, if we are doing different learning process and we are using the, this technique, we will have different graphs that have been incorrectly classified. But what we propose is let's focus on one graph that has been incorrectly classified, but 
it was very close to be uh, correctly classified. Uh, for instance, we can think about one graph where the distance between it and the graph, the graphs of with the same class and with different class are very, very close. In this sense, we can, or, or, or very close, or the difference between them is very small. Why do we do this? Because it means that this uh, graph was it, like in the middle of being properly classifi classified or improperly classified. So we will try to uh, uh, modify these distances to make the distance uh, corresponding with the uh, graphs of the same class be the distance between the graph and another of the different class. So we will exchange these distances. So if we write these distances as the sum of each operation that has been done uh, multiplied by uh, its corresponding uh, cost, and we normalize by the number of, of nodes of both uh, graphs, okay, what we do is we exchange these distances and then we introduce a small modification in the costs to, to make them be, each one exchange the value with the other. So in this, uh, in this process, we don't uh, change the uh, um, operations that we have done between the transformation in the graph. I mean, if we did a number of substitutions or a number of deletions, we don't change these, these operations. What we modify is only the, the costs. Okay, after some operations, we obtain uh, this, uh, sorry, I didn't say here. Here, when we do this, this exchange, we introduce a very small modification that we call here alpha. Uh, we do a very small modification and after doing some operations, then we obtain, we can obtain these uh, uh, expressions of the alphas that we need to correct these, this uh, graph that had been incorrectly classified. And then we obtain uh, different costs in each step of this method. Okay, we do an iterative process and it, in, in each step, we only modify the costs to correct only one, one graph. Okay, we have, uh, with this idea, we applied this method um, to a data set, uh, well, mm, sorry, to a database that is uh, published in this is the benchmarking platform for legal and basic virtual screening. We applied it to six different databases. Uh, after doing uh, the molecule reduction of the the molecules that are, are published in this in this web page, and then we compared uh, our results. Sorry, I didn't uh, put here the references of this method. Sorry, but I can share with you. We compare uh, the results we obtained with uh, other algorithms that have been published. These first rows, uh, these methods, they only consider the graphic distance. They, they do the, the nearest neighbor using the graphic distance, using in the first one, using the costs that were uh, um, imposed by Harper, the author Harper, and they obtained very good results. Then uh, we did the same, but instead of uh, doing, uh, instead of applying the, their costs, we, in, uh, we put all the costs with ones. And as you can see, the, the values are uh, a bit lower, but they are good as well. And then we compared with another, another uh, method. Here, these four rows, uh, that this, uh, this is another learning method is from of Carlos Garcia. And they did a learning process, but in, uh, instead of learning all the, the costs, they learned in each of their, their experiments, they only learned one, one cost in, in each experiment. And then the, the results that we obtained, uh, uh, we, we improved the results in some of the databases. The, the mean value, it was uh, the highest one. 
But we realize that this method, uh, if we um, initialize the costs with the Harper initialization, the same as in the first row, or if we initialize with ones like here, uh, we see that the results are uh, much lower than with the Harper initialization. This means that it's true that this method is not robust uh, if we change the initialization. And we couldn't um, uh, demonstrate the convergence of this, this method. So we, we did it, we developed it, but we are trying to improve how to do this. So the conclusions and future work that we propose it, we have uh, developed a method to learn the graphic distance cost and we applied it to classification task. And what we want to do is to apply this idea, this method to other types of data and analyze other methods of updates the of updating the the cost these alphas that we introduce and yeah it could be the method can be improved of course and that's all thank you very much Any questions please a very short question usually if you have a convex optimization function you always converge to the proper minimum but in general you have multiple uh, uh, local minima mm -hmm. did you observe such local minima can you repeat the question sorry i didn't hear uh, can you uh, are there graph configurations mm -hmm. where uh, 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 you can, can converge to different solutions depending yes. on how you initialize your system yes Yes, yeah, this is a very big lack of this method. Yeah, as I comment in the results, yeah, if we initialize the method in one point in some with some values, the we we saw that the results are very different. As you said, these local minimums that we have, uh, we 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 are not able to to avoid them to to go to the best minimum yeah because the the modifications that we are uh, uh, including in the costs are very very small and another point is that when when we correct a graph that had been incorrectly classified the lack is that other graphs that had been correctly classified uh, become incorrectly classified this is this is not very big number but is yeah we, yeah we need to improve this but i think the idea of um, going and focus on the molecule sorry on the because i we did this on molecules but the idea of going and trying to fix these graphs that were like in the middle i think it's interesting because in some when we do optimization or all the learning processes that we know, we when we do the optimization fu function, we we always do the error. We considering all of the the graphs or all of the the elements of the set, but maybe we could give some different weights or something like this to to this kind of elements. Yes, you it's can the, try simulated or needing. Sorry? Simulated and needing to ah, jump yeah, out of yeah. the local minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. that was one of the clauses. Uh, one idea could be to add a weight. So, here we are uh, adding this alpha and moving through this point. But so, we could add a weight and then first, as we were doing first, yeah. going faster, yeah. trying to jump from one minimum to the other one, and then going slower. Yeah. Not to, to move to the maximum. Yes, yeah. this could be a nice yeah. idea. Yeah. Right. So I think any other questions? I don't see, so we can move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so supervised out of distribution detection, is there any latent scale gun? It's going to be presented by Yonggi Cho. Hi, my name is Yonggi Cho, and I will introduce the preferred self supervised out of distribution detection with dynamic latent scale GAN. 
Many demonic models were trained with the assumption that their input data would have been sampled from the same data distribution. Those methods do not operate properly when input data does not belong to the trained data distribution. For example, and in the left figure, if the cat is an input to a dog space classifier, it may output the wrong results. Or the classifier can be fooled through an adversarial attack as shown in the right figure. Effectively, when only in distribution data is given, Detecting unseen out of distribution <coughs> data that does not belong to the in distribution data is called all the detection. Uh, in general, since the range of all the data is very wide in high dimensional data space, it is almost impossible to define an all the data set and use it for ID only classification. Uh, previously, methods using statistics, statistics of an upper layer or intermediate layer of a pre-trained deep learning models were proposed. Uh, in this paper, we propose auto DLS scan, a method to detect out of distribution using the encoder of a dynamic data scale again. DLS scan is a learning-based scan inversion method with maximum likelihood estimation of the encoder. Uh, it solves the problem that the generator loses information when training the encoder that predicts all latent codes through dynamically scaling the latent random variable. Uh, this enables the train of a converting encoder that inverts the generator. The figure shows the algorithm to get the loss for the training DLS game. Uh, more detailed explanations are in the DLS game paper. Uh, since another DLS scan uses the trained encoder of DLS scan, training on the DLS scan is the same as training DLS scan. This equation shows the algorithm to get. Uh, this equation shows how to another DLS scan calculate the OD score of the input data. The OD score is simply the negative log likelihood of the predicted latent code. In this equation, x is the input data, and e is the encoder, f and mu are the probability density function and mean vector of the latent random variable, respectively. And v is the traced latent variance vector of DLS If the old score of the latent code is low, it is classified as ID data, and if it is high, it is classified as OD data. And there are two main features that the DLS scan encoder can be used for all the detection. Uh, first is the latent entropy optimality. When DLS scan converges, the entropy of scaled latent random variable and scaled latent encoder output becomes optimal entropy for expressing ID data with the generator and encoder. Uh, therefore, since ID data is densely mapped to a latent code with high likelihood, all the data can only be mapped to a latent code with low likelihood. Uh, secondly, elements of the DLS and encoder output are independent of each other and follow a simple distribution. So it is very easy to calculate the low likelihood of the predicted latent code. This figure shows the beginning of the training of DLS scan. In this figure, the G is the generator and V is the latent random vector. The F is the latent scale vector. Uh, one can see that the scale latent random variable has high entropy and the scale encoder output has low entropy at the beginning of the training. Uh, this figure shows DLS scale after convergence. In this figure, the scale latent random variable and the scale encoder output have the same distribution, and it is optimal entropy to represent the ID data, ID data distribution. Now I'll show you the results of the Anodia scan experiment. The full code for our work are in this bit of link, and this link is also in the paper. We used at least 110 digits data set as an ID data set. 
This image in the first, this column are ID images, and the right parts are the all the images. Images between these two white lines are near all the, near all the images. Near all the images are generated by linear interpol interpolation between these far all the images and ID images. The ID image rate of near all the image is 0 0.9 and all the image rate is 0 0.1. The near image near all the images are hard to distinguish for humans without looking very closely. We train the four types of models for all the detection. Each model is trained only with ID trained data set. Training info again is same as training DLS scan without a dynamic latent scale. All figures are average value of seven for cross, cross validation. So this figure shows the model architecture used in the experiment. Uh, we use only convolution layers and upsample, downsample, and fully connected layers for the grid. On the DLS scan, info again, and auto encoder uses both encoder and decoder, and the classifier uses only an encoder. This table shows far all the detection performance for each method. Uh, AURC was used for evaluation. Info again used the same OD score function as on the DLS scan with the traced latent variance vector. Autoencoder used mean squared error between input and reconstructive image for OD detection. The classifier used energy score and react for OD detection. Use T and P are the hyperparameters for the energy score. In this table, you can see that the overall performance of ONO DLS scan and autoencoder is the best. Energy score and, and react showed we react showed relatively poor performance in some data sets. This table shows near wood detection performance for each method. The performance of ONO DLS get was not significantly different from the auto reconstruction in far OD detection, but uh, but this it, it shows a significantly better performance in near OD detection, even if the reconstruction performance of the autoencoder was much better than other DLS scans. So uh, can see, you can see that the other DLS scan has clearly better OD detection performance than info gain in both tables. In summary, we found that the low likelihood of the late transport predicted by encoder of DLS scan can be used for OD detection. On a DLS scan does not require any mutual information of the training data set, such as lab labels or additional hyperparameters like energy score. Uh, also, on the DLS scan can be used for any data domain and uh, outperforms previous state of art methods. Thank you for listening to the presentation. The next talk is a novel graph channel based on the rapid time distance spectrum. Well, welcome, everybody. And um, it's nice to be here. I'm Andrea Torsello from uh, University of Foscari of Venice, and I'll be presenting a joint work with Ontario and Luca Rossi from Queen Mary University of London. This work is actually uh, originally uh, derived from the master's thesis of Yanta Luca, with of course some extension to it. And it's about, it's about into introducing uh, graph kernels using spectral signatures, combining spectral signatures and the West Stand distance. So what? So why, uh, what is the problem here? First, we have graph representations which are, have been used, uh, well, well, basically they represent a natural way to abstract data and, and data anytime you have 
um, what the only time where the observables are actually entities and relationship will, will, rather than just a, a sort of a, a clear vectorial representation of, of observables. Uh, this is actually quite common in a lot of fields. You can have chemical compounds, but then you have protein protein interaction or biological pathways, but then you have social networks, you have uh, ethological networks. Uh, so uh, graph structures and graph based representation are natural in a lot of natural descriptors of a lot of pheno different phenomena. And so uh, since we have this natural representation, we also want to be able to do learning on that. On, on that. And of course, we have, we have been trying to do that, or we're having uh, we've had some degrees of success for over 50 years. We're basically 50 years doing, we've been doing uh, structural pattern recognition for over 50 years now, but it's still, uh, and, I mean, still uh, not as straightforward and obvious approach that we, as we would do with um, vectorial data because we have some problem, some uh, lacking or lacking lack structure uh, when you have graphs. First of all, we don't have, we, we're lacking economical ordering of the node uh, and we have a different var uh, variable number of nodes. So graphs simply cannot be easily mapped or directly mapped into um, fixed angst vectors. So there have been a lot of different approaches to this, throughout these 50 years with various forms of embedding. One that provides a very elegant solution is of course uh, the idea of the, um, computing graph kernels, which have some, um, of course, the, the Mercer uh, producer theorem uh, guarantee that we do have an implicit embedding and we can then treat the data as vectorial, the implicit treat the data as vectorial data and then use all, a lot of the approaches that have been developed um, for vectorial pattern recognition. Uh, recently also have, of course, the evolution of graph, uh, neural, uh, graph neural networks, which are increasing in popularity. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, variations on the theme of uh, graph neural networks, but let's say that the most common one and the most widely adopted one are based on the idea of message passing as a, as a fundamental tool um, to, to redefine a convolution. Uh, but then if you do that, you, you, you can show that the um, the networks are not more cannot be more descriptive than the, the than the Westman and Lehman kernel. So they still do, although very powerful, they still do have a limitation. So what are graph kernels? The fundamental idea between graph kernels is just to compute compute some form of either explicit or implicit embedding. In kernels, in general, the idea is to have um, the kernel implicit by computing. Uh, non-linear dot product between the points or sort of non-linear dissimilarity between the points. And in the craft domain, uh, sometimes you obtain that uh, by having a sort of uh, explicit um, explicit embedding. So a lot of uh, different graph, uh, kernels defined on graphs actually define, uh, should more um, uh, more exactly be defined as uh, embedding approaches from which they extra extract dot products rather than uh, implicit kernels as you have um, with a lot of other uh, vectorial representations. Um, the approach for this is basically to first decompose the graph into set of substructures or so have elements uh, that can be recognized and atomic elements you know how to compare and then compare this with the graphs in terms of the set you have of this uh, substructure. Um, so the our idea here to define a kernel for graphs is to propose to represent these graphs as a set of points and such a particular set of points that describe the local global encoding of structural information at different scales. We do that by, at least in this paper, we do that by applying a spectral signature. Again, that this is a, um, well understood and, uh, and uh, developed and exploited approach to tr try to uh, uh, extract this, um, invariant descriptors for, um, uh, for graph structures. And the most common one is of course uh, the heat kernel signature, which basically measures the um, uh, the reheating the reheating of a um, of a point for a, a random walk or heat diffusion. Um, from that, uh, from the same node. So basically, the probability that after a time t, um, random walk or, or heat diffuser starting from a node v will actually come back to node v. 
And that can be shown that it can be expressed in terms of properties of the Laplacian, in particular properties of the spectrum of the Laplacian. And as you do computation of it, it's, you'll, you'll see it's just basically a low pass filter on the Graf Laplacian spectrum so that you have the, uh, the spectral element with um, eigenvector of the Laplacian, the, the eigenvector of the Laplacian, and then you'll have the, the negative exponential of the eigenvalue, which do a damping uh, of the components depending on the actual uh, the actual frequency uh, we're looking at, which basically results in the low pass filter. Another very powerful uh, kernel signature is the wave kernel signature, which basically uh, looks at the um, observation probability of a quantum occurs starting from a particular point, uh, for, uh, starting from a steady state distribution to a particular point. Um, where the the, steady state, the initial distribution is uh, defined in terms of the energy level of that particular distribution. The definition of that particular energy level, so the fact that we're looking not in, uh, through time, but through energy levels, means that the, uh, the graph signature will actually do a, a results in a band pass filter on the spectrum rather than a low pass filter with the kernel. And this, of course, they have these two different, different characteristics have different abilities of actually um, uh, encoding and capturing uh, a small scale and large scale um, uh, relationship within the structure. Um, and the final component, of course, is the vast wire distance, which is, you know, you can see that the vast uh, wire distance between discrete probabilities is just defined as this, uh, this quantity W of X, Y, which is uh, the minimum over all the uh, transport matrix of the, all the transports from X to Y of uh, the dot product of Frobenius product, the product between the matrices, so the Frobenius product between the, um, the transport plan and the uh, matrix of distances between every element of X to every element of Y. So this is, um, Basically, a, a, a sort of um, continuous discretization, uh, continuous relaxation of, a, of a, an assignment um, of a bipartite bipartite matching over the um, distances of the points themselves. And so, with all this um, various um, ingredients to hand, we can actually look at what. Uh, how we actually define the construction of the, 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 kernel, the this kernel pipeline. First, for where we have, we have we want to compare two different graphs, G1 and G2. First, we compute the matrix of the um, of the uh, spectral features. So here we have the columns one Tn. Uh, in the case of a heat kernel, so uh, if you parameterize over time over. Um, over time, so we have one column per time sample that we take, and of course, one row per node of each graph. We have these two matrices, this is X and this is Y. Uh, we assume we have exactly the same number of time slices, of course, different number of nodes. And we can compute the uh, distance matrix by taking basically the uh, Euclidean distances between rows of X and rows of Y. And so we compute here the, the distance D, which is N by N in this case. And from this matrix, we can just compute the minimum of the Frobenius norm between uh, P and D to obtain, sorry, the, um, uh, to, to obtain um, the what's uh, finite distance, uh, the graph of finite distance. And then uh, as we take the um, negative exponent, uh, negative exp exponential, of this distance, we obtain, uh, we actually obtain the, the kernel. So this is basically the fundamental construction. Uh, the only uh, thing we need to add uh, to it is the way we can actually, we actually generate the feature. The feature are not just uh, necessarily the, only the spectral feature. We can actually incorporate uh, the node feature that we had on the structure themselves. And we do that basically doing a weighted, uh, weighted concatenation between uh, the um, spectral component X and the feature component F. So basically the actual final feature here uh, is this concatenation of the two components where the 
um, spectral component is multiplied by a weight uh, value w, and the feature component is multiplied by minus one, my, one minus w, and then these two rescale the components are just concatenated in a long in a long vector. So this is basically the definition of um, the kernel. One question okay, immediately comes uh, with its idea of kernel is whether we can say that this kernel is uh, uh, positive definite. And unfortunately, we're not able to uh, guarantee that. The reason for that is that this is, in a, in a sense, very similar to uh, Forlex and our um, optimal assignal kernels. Uh, if actually, if we instead of doing the assignal distance, we, we actually had a bipartite matching, this would actually be a, a particular case of an optimal assignment kernel. Uh, this, of course, is a generalization of that. It's a generalization of this special case, but it's still pretty, pretty much linked to it. And of course, Vert in 2008 uh, showed that um, optimal assignment kernels are not necessarily um, the, uh, positive definite, even if they're defined as combination of uh, positive kernels. And the reason for that is that we lack transitivity in node correspondences. So let's say that the node one in G1 might be uh, mapped by this optimal assignment to node two in G2, and then node two in G2 might be um, assigned to node one in G3, but then you have no guarantee that node one in G1 is assigned to node one in G3. And the lack of that, um, uh, of that sort of transitivity uh, is what hinders a, a proof for, um, uh, for, for positive definiteness in general for assignment kernels. Uh, that being said, so we, while we cannot actually have a formal proof, optimal assignment kernels have been used in literature quite extensively. And uh, in all experiments where we have all the, uh, the kernel matrices were always positive definite. So we haven't encountered uh, experimentally known uh, positivity, uh, non-positivity that simply we know it's in, in, it's in the realm of possibility for assignment kernels. So this is basically how we construct uh, we, we construct the uh, the final kernel. Uh, going from that, we can actually try to see how we experiment and see how uh, we uh, can use this kernel and what performance we have. So we consider four widely used graph classification data set: uh, new tag, PTCA, MR, proteins, and DMD. All these are chemical compounds represented as graphs with atom type and categorical node attributes assigned to them. Uh, so in this uh, experimental result, we do then for cross validation with a grid search for, uh, uh, for uh, extracting optimal hyperparameters using a 91 split of training folds. So, and also we compare this against four graph kernels, uh, very well-known graph kernels, uh, the shortest path, a random walk, graphlets, and a last minor living uh, kernel. And uh, for um, graph and the neural networks, graph sage, a diff pool, VGCNN, and gen. So first we've done a sort of sensitivity analysis to try to understand how sensitive that concatenation parameter is for the various um, feature constructions, um, just to, uh, to, uh, to extract that particular parameter. And so this is actually the, uh, an example of the sensitivity that we've done on proteins using the heat kernel, the combination of heat kernel signatures. And we see that we actually have a sort of peak at the, with a W close to 2.5 um, in this case. But while we do have a, a peak, so that the, that the parameter does have an impact on the optimization, it's still relatively stable and with um, relatively stable throughout the um, range of W. And the same, even more so, can be said when you we use a WKS kernel. Still, uh, there is some uh, variation, uh, some effect of W and a smallish W, in this case, around 1.0.1.0.0.15, seems to be the optimum um, for this particular case. But still, there is the, the behavior is relatively stable. There are not order of magnitude differences in uh, the final performance. So as we go to the actual um, uh, results that we have, uh, well, we can see that our approach uh, mm, exhibit the best behavior, but you know, the best and second best behavior, both on mutag and proteins. 
and have very high, um, re very high results on um, other um, other effects as well, on other uh, the, the other data set as well. Uh, the um, wave kernel signature variant is actually the second best um, in for PPC, uh, PPC on MR. And it's the third best, uh, I don't know, so fourth, fourth best, but still very competitive even in DND. So we still have um, fairly good performance throughout the board um, for, for the proposed kernels. And note that here we have a, we have added WWL, which is a, an approach which does something. It's the Weiss and Lehman, uh, it's the Weiss and Weiss and Lehman uh, kernel, which basically takes the WWL. Um, the WWL uh, descriptors and then performs uh, the Weiss Lehman of the, the of the distances between those descriptors. And in that case, it, it's actually possible to show that the kernel is actually positive definite, and it's so in a sort of in a sort of way a similar approach to what we're doing here. And even that approach, as you see, is actually the, among the best when uh, for the data set where, where we're not necessarily the best. So let's say the gen this general idea of uh, applying uh, a Lehman to substitute the optimality. Uh, of the assignment is actually um, an effective one. Um, just as a conclusion, so we have based we are, we have introduced a novel graph kernel based on the spectral signature and the Weismann elements. And the idea here is that we can with this we can capture both structural uh, and node feature and information of the graph quite effectively and extract uh, power from discriminating kernels. So what what our future works with for this of your envision where we, of course we, we want to do better, we can use better structural signature, but you've already seen that the Vatsalan and Lehman um, can improve the approach. But one of the things we actually want to do is to try to do a learn uh, learned feature and basically try to use a, um, a learned uh, neural network backend to, uh, to learn the features uh, for the final kernel uh, combining. Uh, GNNs and kernel approaches to the, to the problem. Uh, and also, we will we'll need to look into ways to do different ways to encode the features and combine them with the stuff. Thank you. Uh, hey everybody, I'd like to introduce you to my paper uh, titled This Correct Respect for Visual Similarity. And let's, uh, and let's start uh, by uh, a bit on similarity. Similarity is uh, often a uh, widely used concept uh, in computer vision for classification, retrieval, and uh, many other stuff. But uh, what is similarity? Similarity also uh, come from a psychological domain where it was a lot studied for a while. And uh, we can see on this graph that often two objects are similar because of the relation or the attributes of the object here. When you have both relation and attributes matching, we have a literal similarity. It's like synonyms. When you have only relation, it's like an analogy. And when you have only attributes, it's a mere appearance like a visual match. Here, we are interested by those visual match uh, in particular. Here, so here we are especially interested by finding objects which are visually similar while being semantically dissimilar. It's quite uh, unusual. And uh, there is not so many data sets. In fact, I found, uh, we found only one data set of pairs of image proposing two uh, objects which are visually similar while being semantically dissimilar. Dissimilar. This problem is quite complicated. For example, uh, when uh, this data set was uh, created, uh, someone uh, made a benchmark in a retrieval setting and found that neural networks perform really, really, really bad uh, on this uh, particular task. So, in fact, when you take a look uh, at this, this data set uh, with a closer look, you can see that the vast majority of the pairs made are, are uh, faces. Uh, it's often people making those uh, pairs of uh, people looking similar uh, while it's not being the same identity. 
it's not what is uh, interesting for us right now. We are more interested by the other pairs uh, of objects we are similar or humans similar to something else. So uh, we need to create a proper pipeline to have some visual features which are decorated from semantically features. So we took a pre-trained uh, feature extractor uh, on uh, stuff like ImageNet, where it's clipped, a uh, contrastive uh, network, uh, very interesting. We will talk about it a bit later. We make some preprocessing and we adapt uh, those uh, features to a visual space only uh, to uh, bring closer, uh, like we can see here. We want to bring closer to image, which belong to the same pair while being more distant to any other image in the data set. It's learned in a constructive way and the loss is just right and here, but it's not possible. In fact, if you take uh, the feature of a network at different stage, you can see that each neuron is specialized in a particular visual aspect. Uh, so for example, this neuron was the most activated by those images. No, this neuron is activated by this color this by this pattern, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we can see that we are able to uh, recover all the information, such as color, texture, forms, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see on this slide uh, the results of retrieval. When we take uh, an input, we want to match this output, and uh, we can see before the adaptation and after the adaptation. So when you take a pre-trained neural network uh, on classification task, you can see that the results returned are semantically similar, but are not really uh, the most interesting in the visual point of view. But after devising this semantical advice uh, toward our uh, visual uh, task, we can see that we can uh, find some more interesting uh, looking images, for example, on this row. So here we are more interested by this paper, which is finding the respect of visual sonority. So maybe some of you never heard about uh, the word respect, uh, I think, uh, especially for this uh, kind of task. In fact, respect is uh, widely used, especially in uh, psychology. Uh, you can find a lot of paper and uh, uh, psychologists reformulate the task of telling how two images are similar, how much they are similar, into a little different question, which is how are they uh, similar, in which respects this comes from here. So we are interested by two aspects of those respects. First of one, what can be compared together? And the second one is why two things are compared. So the first uh, thing to know is uh, in our case, we are dealing with non-literal similarity. So what is compared to what? For example, a human and a cat is, can be compared. And uh, to discover this, what, those what's, we propose to uh, slightly modify the Camille's algorithm to closer the semantic displacement from cats to human. What is the displacement you have to make in the semantical space? And by doing so, we are able to find uh, some watts. And for example, there is a, a cluster. We can find we are able to say uh, in this cluster that's compared to uh, to humans. The second uh, interesting uh, question is why are things are compared? So, like we said earlier, how similar are uh, X and Y? Uh, it's similar to how are similar uh, those two? So to do so, we used uh, some uh, techniques inspired by topic modeling, uh, such as uh, the non-negative matrix factorization. <coughs> and uh, we'll dig a bit in detail just here. So we have some adapted uh, visual uh, features, which, is, which are hard to interpret because they are in high dimensionality. The dimensionality is uh, 1024, so it's very hard to interpret. But we always have a feature which has positives because they are outputted after all. So we can uh, say it's like histograms of visual words. Each characteristic of our memory things is like a visual word. And uh, from this idea of visual words, we can apply some topic modeling uh, idea, just like the NMF. And to say why two images are similar, it's because they share 
of similar attributes. It's the intersection of uh, the two images. It's similar because they both have this attribute and this attribute. To model this, and we used a fuzzy T norm, which is simply uh, an Adamo product. Uh, yeah. And for example, here is the, uh, the respect from this cluster of why they are proposed to be uh, visually similar. So uh, the facial expression. Uh, just uh, as you see in uh, before, each time we propose some words uh, associated with uh, the cluster, and those words uh, were not made by humans. They were, were automatically proposed by a neural network. Uh, clip we talked uh, we mentioned uh, it a uh, few, few few minutes ago, uh, which was uh, trained in a constructive way to bring in the same space visual images and semantically uh, text text meanings. So we when uh, looking at this cluster proposed by another paper, um, Martin Hippard, which is really interesting, those are the human proposed terms. And when you ask to uh, the neural network to automatically to find some words from uh, one kilo word, uh, one thousand, uh, one eleven thousand words, uh, those are the proposed terms. And uh, there is some evaluation here to just match that it's uh, sufficiently related. And after we just uh, train interest. So uh, if you have time, uh, we have time uh, with some questions. There are some other clusters, so you can uh, find it if uh, it's relevant or not, of why two stuff are completely uh, visually. So here, it's maybe for the color, or uh, because uh, all of them are twins, the special disposition, the mustache. Those are some respects uh, automatically. Uh, so, uh, UI. And just after we have some what's so for example uh, everyday objects compared to star wars uh, objects so the task was uh, particularly difficult because there is no grand truth uh, the problem is quite new uh, so there is absolutely no grand truth and only some qualitative uh, evaluation and so it's more like uh, a discussion a new discussion on this kind of topic so if you have uh, any question or any remarks uh, you're welcome thank you very much Any more questions? Yes. <laughs> uh, two questions, very fast. Yes. So I understand that your database, you have several images. Yes. Okay. We and have pairs of images. Pairs of images. And okay. only positive pairs. And so this pair of images is someone, a person, not artificial intelligence. A person said, this is similar to this. Full yes, stop. it's only that. And we don't have any crown trucks. And but, so unsupervisedly, we found those crystals. Okay, but I have understood that Looking at the images, I understood that, that, that the images that are similar are the ones that simply the distance between pixels is low. Uh, no, the distance right. between pixels can't work because uh, there are similar, because uh, a lot of various oh, reasons, they are not aligned at all. For example, well, possibly there is a, a, a rotation or a scale, but it seems that people what have done is doing more or less the, the distance between pixels, no? Although- No, for some example, location... here and here, there is no pixel matching at all. And the database is mostly composed of images like those which are not at all alignable. Okay, okay. So it's very complicated. We need to extract a lot of feature of it. Yeah. So similarity can range from uh, the, the structural similarity of the image, the texture, the shape, the color, Special. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's that the people who have said this is similar. Yes, I mean, it's you only don't, that. You don't it's, know why people uh, have said this is similar. The database was tracked uh, by the, the author of this article on the website of NIMS. Yes. So it's. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Where's your link? Basically, you have to tell your algorithm if you, if you want to search the similar object, you you have to tell if you search similarity by color or by no. shape. Or no, 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 just by this cover is like. Just give me examples. examples. Yeah, but if, for example, if you if you want just just put by color, just just specify it. We don't have label. It's uh, we don't know if it's similar by color at all. There is no information. We we so we have to find a way to discover all those uh, respects, all those reason. And so here are the proposed words by the clip network 
uh, associated. It's like uh, the prototype of uh, explanation of the cluster. But so there is no there is no clue uh, in advance to say oh the respects from similarity are uh, so basically you cannot control that we can't control it. there is no database uh, unfortunately uh, so maybe uh, one of you can create some database and have a lot of citation with that uh, because i think more useful when you can control uh it's easier to assess indeed to tell if it's well working or not so it's like more uh, like a novel idea. Yeah, Which uh, networks perform best? You know, uh, in the deep networks, called the feature extractor, um, the best feature extractor. We tried the thirty-seven uh, network. It was a, a clip-based network. Clip uh, is a network uh, which is learned from uh, four hundred millions of images from internet net by OpenAI. And uh, it's uh, trained uh, with uh, image and caption. And uh, the goal is to bring closer uh, the, the caption embedding to the image and uh, reciprocally to uh, than uh, any other. It's, it's a bit similar uh, training. It's also a contrastive training, a bit like, uh, like, uh, oops, like this. We need uh, to bring the image closer than the right caption than any other caption proposed. And here we need to bring further the rights made from the extra. How many parameters in the network? Uh, uh, two millions? I, I don't know. I, I, there is several versions of it. Uh, I don't remember. Uh, millions and millions. Many millions. May, I think it's around uh, uh, 100 of them. So it's not one more, one more question. Wait. Yeah. Yes, uh, the lady there. I can go. Okay, you can. Okay. Uh, so, because you, have, you don't have any ground truth and no labels, how did you assess or did you ever assess the performance of the model? Yes, we only had one, one, um, one idea it's uh, to qualitatively assess uh, the cluster. So, we asked it to its cluster to 33 participants. Uh, to answer to uh, this task, find uh, what may be the, uh, the common respect of a given cluster and uh, tell how much this respect, how much the cluster uh, is in alignment with the respect. Because, for example, in the cluster, there could be some uh, mislabeled uh, samples. Yeah. So there is not the graph, the graph in the paper of the, the assignment. So it's basically human knowledge uh, assessment. Yes. Maybe please ask your question. Okay. Last um, question. I wonder uh, what's your uh, evaluation for the result? Or there has some uh, values? Or there has some uh, some message like uh, some some test for the inter interpretation to to explain the result? What's well, the, there are two evaluation: the evaluation of the cluster funds and the evaluation of the words. Uh, which one are, are you talking about? I wonder uh, what the result you got, only two images, or also have some explanations for the result. Yes, so the explanation proposed by the networks are the words. And so here, the uh, evaluation is uh, there is some graph here. So we had some clusters, which were found uh, by another paper, interesting, very interesting. And this, uh, this paper provides some cluster and uh, human words, OK? And so we can compare the human words proposed to explain this cluster to the words proposed by uh, the network automatically. And so here in green, we can see there are only two words in common. But if you look, even if the results to say, oh, with only five words, it's only 75% uh, of uh, correctness, you can see, for example, disks, there is a lot of synonyms and the uh, orthographic uh, mismatch. But the idea of the circularity is well, uh, it, it seems to be good. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Sarafat Lala, and I'm a PhD student in my first year uh, from Universitat Rovira i Virgili. That's based in Tarragona, Spain. 
And uh, today I'm going to present to you my work with my supervisors, uh, Kermit Julia and Francesc Seratosa, whom you may have already come across because uh, he's um, attending the workshop presently, or you've uh, heard about him from the previously presented work by my colleague, Elena Rica. And today we're going to talk to you about our work with uh, graphs, uh, regression namely, based on uh, graph autoencoders. And in this presentation, I will run you through uh, a few basic definitions of the approaches that we used and our methodology, how we applied it, and the results we got and our analysis of them. Now, as you may have already guessed, we're very interested in graphs and um, graphs as a former colleague who represented uh, Andrea, I think, uh, same definition. It's a very natural way to represent structures in real life. Uh, that could be anything from social networks, citation networks, uh, molecular compounds. Uh, you could use graphs to represent them, and they work by um, linking two instances uh, with edges or vertices uh, based on a shared attribute. Um, another main component in our work is our graph convolution networks. And uh, graph, graph convolution networks, uh, basically, they're a neural network that is very deep with many layers, uh, as you may already know, uh, which takes input, uh, chunking it into small pieces of data and uh, computing on that, whether it's some um, summation or averaging, uh, giving you a representation of the input that you give it. So you give it C input, uh, depending on how many features you have, and then it would give you some kind of a feature map for the input that you've given it. So uh, we also have another main component, which is a graph autoencoder. Uh, it's basically based on convolutional neural networks. And the way it works is that it encodes the graph structure, uh, giving you a representation that is a, could be a vector representation by well, first, uh, it takes two inputs. So it takes an adjacency matrix that would give you the relation between the different nodes in a graph. And it would give you also a feature matrix or a feature vector that would give you the, uh, the attributes for each of these nodes. And um, with the graph, neural, graph convolutional network, you can obtain a Latin domain, uh, which would have in it a uh, uh, feature vector that would be a representative of your graph, uh, a compatible representation of your graph. And the, the no. way- No, I have this the graph. Well. Your slides are not moving. No, because the they- uh, your, your edit mode for uh, your PowerPoint. Uh, which slide are you seeing now? Oh, the first one. Nothing yet, the title. The title. Oh, still, that's weird because um. Here I'm, I'm seeing the sixth slide. Uh, sorry, let me just check into that. Can you can you see them now? Um, just the first slide. Okay. Um, so one second. I'm gonna restart this. Right now? Yes. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um, okay. This is what. Yeah. Um. You haven't missed much. Uh. Just yeah. Uh, how graph convolution neural networks look. Uh. They take information and they give you a feature map or a feature representation of the input. Um. I'm assuming that most of you are already familiar with what a graph convolution neural network is. And um. I was yeah just breaking down what a graph autoencoder does, which is um based on the same idea. That was the brilliant work of Kipf. And it takes an adjacency matrix with its feature matrix, and then it gives you a latent representation for that. And the way it does so by taking the latent vector it has retrieved or obtained, and then it tries to reconstruct an adjacency matrix uh, noted here by A star. And with this, it, it well, the way the learning happens is by a well a quadrant loss function. So it just compares the um, the resulting adjacent matrix with the original one that you have, and this was the base of the model that we were testing uh, using graph autoencoders 
to then try to use it for our prediction missions. So what we have done in our work is that uh, take, the, take the classic uh, graph convolution neural network or your um, graph order encoder, uh, try to obtain these latent vectors from, and then on top of that, we would base either a linear regression model model or a neural, neural network model and see what predictions we get with both. So uh, just to note, this was done kind of parallelly and um, it's not that they work together simultaneously, it's just to see which one would perform better based on a GCN. And um, the reconstructed matrices were just used to learn the weights of, of the autoencoder. They were not used then later for training the neural network or the linear regression model. Uh, our test or case study here was uh, molecular structures and uh, atomization energy. This is what we were interested in. And uh, well, the configuration of the architecture, you can look at it here. Uh, we had our dimension, well, based on the data set that we used, which was uh, a data set QM7, it was used for uh, chemical compounds and representing them. The attributes that we used specifically were the um, atomization energy and the atom ID, and also the uh, 3D coordinates of each atom uh, given a certain molecule. Uh, for the dimensions of the uh, Latin space that we had for the autoencoder, it was 24 by 3. And the neural network that was used for predictions later on was a shallow neural network of just one layer. And the weights, there were two sets or matrices of weights. Uh, one was 100 by 4, and the other one was 100 by 3. And the data set is, uh, well, relatively large. It's about 7,000 compounds. We used about 500 graphs of them. Um, of course, I forgot to mention that they were transformed into graphs or pre-processed as graphs, so they can use, be used for the graph autoencoder. And uh, 5,000 of those were used for training. The remaining 2,000 were used for testing. Uh, this was done over 20 training epochs. And um, these, uh, these results, so results were compared from taking the uh, Latin vectors and then using them for prediction for both a regression model and a neural network. But they were also compared against um, a classical method that is used for um, graph regression, which is our um, nearest neighbor. So if you can look here at the results, uh, we used two metrics. One of them was the loss between the predicted energy and the actual energy, and the other one is the mean squared error. And if you can just look at the plots here, you can tell that, uh, well, both regression and neural networks, they perform kind of okay in terms of accuracy, uh, while nearest neighbor was a little bit all over the place. And you could also notice that the neural network is kind of have the um, most closest results to, um, to actual uh, labels or to actual values in this case. So uh, we also did a runtime analysis because we were also interested in the computing complexity of each of these methods and their combinations. And we realized that uh, when we tried to train for the linear regression, it took about five hours. A neural network took just two minutes and the longest of them all was the nearest neighbor, which took approximately eight, 12 hours to, to train. And, um, from this, so our interest is a prediction of energy, of atomization energy to be specific in uh, molecular compounds. And our findings from this experiment is that uh, compared to nearest neighbors, which is considered um, a classical or a go-to approach for um, graph predictions, uh, we found out that uh, both neural networks and regression based on order encoders would outperform nearest neighbors and not only in terms of accuracy, but as well as the computing, computational complexity or the computing, computing time. So our future directions from here is to go test on more data sets that are related to our molecular interactions and see how we can define an algorithm that would be able to capture the weights or the feature of the features of both the neural network and a regression model in kind of a simultaneous way. And this is it, the, the, that's our work for now. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the presentation.
Uh, I have one question. Uh, I see uh, that uh, you uh, use a uh, GCN, but did you try uh, others uh, convolution, graph convolution? Did we try, sorry, I didn't catch that. Did we try convolution, uh, okay. other types uh, of convolution you're saying? Uh, with other uh, graph convolutions, other type, like uh, GIN or GANS uh, convolution. Well, I, I would say that what well, GANS specifically have been considered, uh, there might be a future direction there to, to test them. But as of now, no, not yet. But yeah, there are other methods that are being taken into consideration to be tried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Mozan. Today I'll talk about distributed decision tree. Um, so I'll start with the decision tree that we all know and that build on top. So for a decision tree at prediction time, what we do is starting from the root, recursively for each node, we ask if the node, if, if each node is a leaf or not. If it's a leaf, we output a response. If it's not a leaf, we make a decision between left and right subtrees based on some decision function and delegate the decision to one of those subtrees. Typically, this is a univariate decision function. So we compare one of the features against a threshold, but you can imagine other decision functions like, you know, it could have been a linear split, for instance, like so. To train this model, um, Recursively, we do the following. Starting from the root, we find the best decision split. So this could be, for instance, based on Gini index or you know, entropy or univariate trees. Um, and then if the split is good, based on dev set, um, we recurse on each children. So it keeps splitting. If it's not good, if there's no improvement, we can just stop and keep the node uh, as a leaf and learn the best response value. So to get to soft decision trees, uh, we make a relaxation. So instead of picking one of the left or right children exactly, we pick them softly. So instead of either going to left or right, we're, go we're gonna go to both of them with some amount that is defined by this gating function. And that gating function, you know, it makes sense that it could be something like a sigmoid on top of a linear split. So we take you know, left subtree or right subtree with some proportion. Training is almost exactly the same uh, at the high level, except when finding the best split uh, with the children parameters and the best splitting hyperplane. Now, instead of you know, exhaustively evaluating all possibilities, we do SGD because given these three nodes, uh, this decision is now uh, differentiable and continues. Um, again, if the split is good on the set, we keep splitting, recursing on the children. If not, we can just keep, keep it as a leaf and keep the old response value. To get the budding tree, we're gonna make one more relaxation and we're gonna think of each node, instead, instead of thinking of each node as either a leaf node or an internal node, we're gonna think of each node as both being a partial leaf and a partial internal node. So which is defined by the leafness parameter gamma here. So proportional to its leafness, every node outputs a response. Proportional to its non-leafness, one minus gamma, it delegates the decision to its children. Um, so if you take a pause here and look at this equation, this recursion is actually infinite. So we have the infinite binary tree here. So in practice, to, to end the recursion, we stop when a leafness that equals to one is encountered. And with this definition, we no longer need to incrementally build the tree now. It's end-to-end -end differentiable. So we learn the entire decision tree with you know, all of the parameters and its pre-structure using SGD. So with all of the all of the parameters, this G should be W instead. So that's an error because G is not a parameter. W is. 
Okay, finally, to get to the distributed decision tree, we're gonna take one more relaxation and untie the, the gating functions that decide between the left and right subtrees. So instead of picking softly either left or right subtree in a way that it sums up to one, we're gonna pick them independently using like different splitting hyperplanes. That means we can, you know, either pick the left subtree, right subtree, we can turn both of them on and additively combine them, or we can turn both of them off as well and end the decision early. Uh, the training is same, still end-to-end -end differentiable. So here are some results, uh, quantitative results on regression, binary, and multi-class classification. So we show base, you know, compared to classical decision tree baselines, it's competitive. There are many wins and some loses, but in the interest of time, I'll uh, get to the qualitative results, uh, which I think are more interesting. So here on, so we have a toy regression data, one dimensional sinusoidal that we fit the trees on top. Um, and for each node, uh, we show with the red curves, the response that it outputs at that node, so that subtree up to that node. And then for workers, uh, we show the gating function that decides between left and right subtrees. So as it, I mean, uh, as you might expect, leaves start with a constant response because that's how we define the tree. And then using the gating functions, it interpolates between two constants uh, in a soft piecewise fashion and builds up these sigmoid-like looking curves, finally all the way up to like some sinusoidal like looking function. For the distributed tree, we have two gating functions that are untied, it's untied. So we show the second gating using the purple curve. And interestingly, I mean, kind of expected maybe, but still interesting, is that because these two gatings are untied, um, at each node, instead of splitting the, uh, the space into two, two portions, the distributed tree is allowed to divide it into three regions. So using just uh, some uh, constant children, flat children response, it's able to have like a multiple breaking point. So there's like a tiny decrease here and then starts to increase, which is not possible with the button tree. And here we show visualizations on MNIST. So if this was a hard decision tree, what we, we would do is for each node, look at all the input instances that falls onto that node and just take the average and plot it here. But there's no, there's no exact notion of such membership because every data point falls onto every node with some proportion. And using, using the gating values, we define a soft membership and use that to take a weighted average instead, you know, plot that instead. And we see, you know, interesting hierarchies like here, you know, nine and four that look similar that are split into two, and then you know, seven is further split into two. For distributed tree, as I said, there's an option of not picking either of the nodes, so it's allowed to shut down both of the gates and then early stop at a given node. So we see, for instance, for this tree, you know, it it for digit four. It actually shuts down both of the subtrees and then predicts, makes a prediction of class four here instead of the way we then work. Thanks. Okay, please. Do you have any comparison with, for example, uh, regular trees? Uh, when you say regular tree, do you mean like C? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is yeah. There's C four five here that we compare numerically, not qualitatively, but yeah. which data set? So these are from UCI. So there are like a bunch of different data sets that that I don't remember anymore. That it's been you know ten. I think this is ten, right? Ten regression and binary and class. So you can, you know, find all of these. 
but they're relatively small size. They're not as big as, say, you know, ImageNet or CIFAR. Or... Yeah. If you compare it to deep neural forests. That's also a good question. Uh, no, not that's part of this work. Um, I, yeah, yeah, only only decision tree based on, so I don't. And the idea is quite similar for use uh, learning. You can learn, but you can use a neural network that learns free yeah. signals and, and leaves. But there it's a bit different because you know leaves, you start that, you have a uh, uniform distribution of leaves, yeah. and then you start go from there. So yeah. that propagation, propagation goes from leaves to the to the roots. So that's it. And then instead of soft split, you use Bernoulli distribution. So the probability is very well to the right. Right. This becomes actually pretty, you know, it's, it's kind of becomes like a hierarchical sigmoid layer, like a single layer neural network that is governed by this tree hierarchy. So it is possible that it wouldn't be as performant as a neural network. So it's, I kind of see it as somewhere in between, like if there's a spectrum from like an interpretability versus like very strong models, uh, what, you know, on one side you would have normal decision trees on the other neural networks. Maybe this model, you know, tries to find a sweet spot in between. All right, I think uh, because of overtime, you know, we'll apply by, by the terms of, of time learning is the uh, person learning processes. Uh, you you didn't compare this, how it's longer or yes, training. yes. So it's both training is longer, inference is also longer, right? Because in decision trees, you just pick you know one, one of the paths and then go straight to the leap, but here you have to go through all of the nodes, so yeah. That is a downside. But back, back propagation, I think, yeah, I think they have. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Hard stop. No soft stop there anymore. <laughs>